Well, this morning we are continuing a sermon series that we started last week on Easter Sunday called The Ripple Effect. And what we're talking about here is how the death and the resurrection of Jesus impacts everything. That event that happened 2,000 years ago has had a way of, of just impacting all kinds of things. Uh, and, and, and last week we talked about just a few of those things that it, that it impacted. We said it impacts our relationship with God. It impacts our sense of identity and purpose. It in, impacts who we are and how we were shaped. And it also impacts our eternal destiny. And, and th those are very important pieces of that. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk more specifically how it, it, the ripple effect impacts different pieces of, of who we are. This morning, we're going to talk about more about how it changes us and, and, and impact there. But we'll also talk about some of the ways that what that means for us in the future uh, as a congregation. That'll be part of what we talk about. And we'll unpack the part about our congregation more and more as we go along here. Uh, we'll also talk about how it changes the church and how we see ourselves as the body of Christ. It changes us and how we relate to one another as family, and it ultimately changes how we impact uh, the, the community and the world around us. And so those will be some of the things that we're looking at over the next few weeks as we talk about the ripple effect. And, and this morning, um, we, we also are, are mentioning, this, is, this came from last week, that uh, we're, we find our identity in terms of God's story. In, in our culture, uh, people want to want to talk about their own sense of identity, their own story, oftentimes apart from reference to anything larger. And we mentioned last week that, that creates all kinds of problems because there's nowhere to anchor it. You you have to, and, and what you end up having to do is make up the idea of purpose for yourself. And there, there's all kinds of things that happen when you don't have a larger story to connect your own to. But as followers of Jesus, we find our story is connected into God's larger story, his story of, of creation, uh, then the fall of redemption by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then the end of the story. We haven't gotten there yet, but it, it's, it's going to come when Jesus returns and sets all things right, and, he, and he, he, he fixes all the brokenness that's in the world, and, and that's something that we long for as followers of Jesus. And right now, our story takes place in the middle uh, of, of God's story between the death and resurrection of Jesus and, and that second coming. And so we find ourselves in the midst of that. And we want to understand not only God's story, but our story as individuals, but also our collective story as a body of Christ. And what does that mean? And we'll unpack that a little bit more as we go. Well, if you are happy, uh, want to follow along with sermon notes, there's actually some sermon notes in your, uh, your bulletin this morning. It will let you know what we're talking about, where we're going, and, and when we're getting close to done as well uh, with that. And, and the very first thing we want to talk about this morning is that God is in the redemption business. Now, when we say business, we don't mean in terms of like making money, but we mean in terms of uh, the, f the familiar English phrase of this is what God's all about. This is what God does. God specializes in redeeming things. He, he's, he's really good at it. In fact, he's, he's so big, so powerful, so loving that he can take things that are wrong and things that are bad and things that are broken as well as the good things and all the stuff in between. And God is powerful enough to take those things and mold them and shape them to come out, turn out for good. In fact, that's just kind of a paraphrase of Romans 8, 28 right there. God can do that kind of thing. He's in the, the business of redemption. And that's what, what really Easter uh, it was all about, that, he, that Jesus died and rose again to redeem us, to call us out of darkness and, and to redeem us. And, and redemption, it has in mind a, a couple of different things. It, one, it's, it's not getting rid of something, right? It, it has in mind the idea of, of restoring it, seeing value in what's there, even though it's broken, even though it might be in the midst of darkness. There, there's still the ability to see what's there and say, we want to, is there a way to, to redeem this, to call it forth, to make it beautiful once again? And we understand that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ were all about that. That the death is where Jesus took upon himself the debt that should have been ours to pay for our sin. And the resurrection is what showed that he conquered not only the grave, but that he rose victorious, saying that, that you stand in a right relationship with God. That, that that sin has been covered and paid for, and now we, we have a new life. That's God's in that redeeming kinds of business. But, but here's 
here's more to it than that. Here's the second point in our sermon. That God calls people out of darkness and he makes them his holy people and royal priests. Now, there's a lot in that. We're going to unpack that a lot more in just a second here. God calls people out of darkness. That's an important thing that he does. He calls them into life, into wholeness and stuff. But he doesn't just let them sit there. He doesn't want it to be uh, just a passive experience for people. In fact, he gives them a role. And this is one of the beautiful things about God, I think, that, that he doesn't just say, okay, I rescued you. Now go sit on the bench, right? Or, or, you know, you're you're like in a boat that was sinking. You get pulled into a life raft. God doesn't say just stay there. He says, no, you help pull other people in. That's that's what God says. We're going to talk about what that means. And and this is part of what Peter is getting at in, in this verse from 1 Peter. Would you read this with me? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What's interesting about that verse is that there's this concept that, that Peter is sharing to the church, and it's made up of both Jews and Gentiles at this point in time. He's basically taking a promise, a, a couple different promises that were extended to the Jewish people. And he's saying, now these apply to all of you. It's not about a race anymore. Now it's about just the people of God, the people that have come to faith. Those promises have now been extended to you. And, and let's talk about the first Pentecost for just a second. A lot of times when we hear the word Pentecost, uh, we think of that, 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 that time in Acts chapter 2 when there's all these people in Jerusalem and, and the, the Holy Spirit came and, and there were tongues of fire. And that is Pentecost. But there was a Pentecost before that Pentecost. In fact, there was a reason why all the people are there gathered. And if, if you remember, what, what happened is when, when God freed the people of Israel out of Egypt and, and they got to cross the Red Sea, well, 50 days after the Passover they wind up at Mount Sinai. And, and Mount Sinai is, is where they were given the law. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's, the, it's all 613 commandments that are part of the Old Testament. That, that was what was given to them there. And what God did is God said, you're coming out of being, people have been slaves for generations. And, and we're going to give you a new sense of identity. And, and, and you're, you're, you're called, I'm, I'm not just pulling you out so that you can go and pursue the Hebrew dream of a white picket fence, a house, the white picket fence, three camel garage, all that kind of stuff. That, that's not what I'm calling you for. I'm, I'm calling you out to be a special people, a holy people. And, and when you see the word holy in the Bible, it, it means one of two things. It's actually used in two different ways. When it refers to God, it refers to the awesomeness of God. It's things like the fact that he is the opposite of darkness, opposite of sin. He's perfect. He's powerful. He's good, completely good. That, that's all wrapped up in holiness when it refers to God. But when holiness refers to like people or objects, it means something a little bit different. In fact, it means set apart something that's set apart specifically for God's purposes. And when God called those people, the, the Israelites, out of, out of the land of, of Pharaoh, he said, you're going to be for me a holy people. The, the laws I'm setting up for you are so you will be set apart. You will be distinct from all the other nations. And, and I'm going to give you a way of living that, that makes you look that way. But, but the point behind this is that you're going to be part of my larger story. You're going to be part of my plan. And I want to make you a kingdom of priests. I want... You, you to look so different from the other nations and so beautiful compared to the way the other nations live that people are drawn to me through you. That was the plan. That was what God said. That, that was the whole purpose of drawing them out. And, and what this meant for the Israelites is that when, when they didn't live out their calling, they didn't live out their faith, it wasn't just about their relationship with God. It was a lot bigger than that. There were other people that were watching them and sort of, you know, meant to be called to God by how they lived and by how they they saw them. And so when the Israelites 
sometimes lived that out. It was good. But other times when they didn't really say, we want to be different, we want to be just like everybody else, they said that a lot. Um, there was a lot more than just their own relationship with God that was being impacted by that. And so God took that very, very seriously. Well, fast forward thousands of years, uh, you come to another day of Pentecost. It was one of the, those feasts where, where God said three times a year, I want all of you to gather in Jerusalem. There was the, the Passover, which is when the death and resurrection of Jesus happened in the midst of that. Then 50 days later, there's the Feast of Pentecost, the second of those feasts that happened. And, and so he, what happened is you got all these people that were in Jerusalem uh, around the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, they, they, they all knew who Jesus was, a very famous, maybe the number one celebrity in that part of the world at that time. People knew who he was. They all knew that he was put to death. But then they all hear these crazy rumors about this guy rose again from the dead. And, and here, here's the thing. They're, they're not just hearing rumors. They're talking to people that said, no, no, I talked to him. I've seen him since that. I, I, I've witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And so there's all these people swarming around Jerusalem coming back 50 days after this event. And Peter preaches that sermon. He says, let me tell you what this means. Let me help you make sense of what happened here. You put Jesus to death. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. And, 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 and now, instead of going, oh, no, we're doomed, actually says, repent, and you can have the forgiveness. You can have new life. You can have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And, and that, that was part of the message of that. And, and just like what happened uh, in the Old Testament when, when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, when they were, were no longer slaves they, they, and they were God's people, they had to think of themselves differently. They had to, to, to see themselves in a different light. So did the people of God at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came, they had to think and understand of themselves differently because no longer did they have to go and offer sacrifices at the temple. It was unneeded, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world had, had, had taken care of the sin thing once and for all. So they didn't see a, a need to do that anymore. And, the, and there, was, there was a move uh, from a lot of the, the Jewish practices and stuff very early on because they go, this just doesn't make sense in light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And they began to see themselves differently. But they also began to live differently amongst their their people. Hears. And, and the verse that, two verses after where we ended, uh, it says there were 3,000 people that were added to their number that day. The church went from a few hundred people to like thousands in one afternoon. And um, what, what that meant, though, is, is that they had to, to, to reform themselves and think differently. And, and what you also see is that the church begins to just really kind of explode at that point, especially in Jerusalem where all this stuff happened, uh, and then it really begins to take off from there. And one of the distinct features about these new Christians what, is that they lived differently. They lived set-apart lives. They lived as holy people. They looked different from the world around them. They, they wanted to do that. And um, that was just an important part of who they are. Now, we're going to talk about what it means to be holy people and royal priests in, in just a second. But there's something you have to understand first. Because if, if we don't understand how this works, the other stuff makes no sense at all. First of all, um, there's a God who loves you. He redeems you. He calls you his own. And that is done based on nothing you can do. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on, on your IQ or any test you can take or how you look or anything like that. There's a God who says, I just simply choose to love you. I simply choose to call you my own and, and I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to pull you out of darkness. I'm going I'm, I'm to save you because I want you to be part of my eternal family. There's a God who does that regardless of your performance. And and that's an important thing for us to grasp. And, and it starts off for a believer to, to get it intellectually up here. To go, I get it. Jesus died for all people. He, God loves us to the point where, where he, he would sacrifice his own son, not just, just to die, but actually to bear the, the brunt of, of, of justice poured out on every dark deed of humanity. That's what Jesus did on the cross. We, we get that. But it has to go from here to here in a way. It's not just to know that Jesus died for everybody. We have to get, we have to understand that he died for me. 
He died for me. That, that God doesn't just love all people, he loves me. Luther made a very big deal about this. He said, I care not that he be Christ. I care that he be Christ for you. There's that personal relationship aspect. You have to understand that it's not just out there for everybody else, but that God really does care about you. And, and once we get that, we can go on to this next part. If you haven't got that yet, we've got to settle that first. But, but once God calls you his own, once you understand that he loves you, once he says, I, I love you, I love having you in my family and on my team, he says things like this, love me back with everything you've got, your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Jesus says things like, follow me, learn to, to walk in my ways. God even says, you're going to be for me a holy people, a people that are set apart. He doesn't love you because you're holy. The response on our part is to be holy, to live set apart lives, to live as distinct people of God. Now, is that what you think of it means to be like a holy person, right? Is that what it means to be, you know, a monk or a nun or something like that? Well, that could be included in that definition, but that's not the definition of Scripture. In fact, the, the Bible says you're all saints. That means holy ones. That's literally what it means, that you've been set apart by God. You've been redeemed by Him. And, and what, it, what it means to be holy people or saints today are, are, is this. First of all, holy people, we, we live distinct lives we, we live in such a way that looks different from the world around us. Just like the, there was the call in the Old Testament for the people of God to, to look differently, to behave differently, to, to have different set of priorities. It, it's the same thing today, that we're called to be those holy people that are set apart. And here's why it's important. It's awfully hard uh, to live out your calling to be a royal priest. We'll tell you more about that. Or it's, it's, it's hard to be salt and light or any of the other things that Jesus talks about you bearing witness to the world if you're not living a holy life, if you're not living set apart. If, if we want to be just like the Israelites that kept saying, we don't want to be different, we want to be just like everybody else, that's a problem for us. That, that becomes a problem because it, it damages your credibility. It's not just your own relationship with God that gets messed with with that. It also damages your credibility to the rest of the world when you seek to talk about God, when you seek to point to Him, that, that there's somehow there's this disconnect. It's not that, that we're, we're not sinful. We're, we're going to struggle with that the rest of our lives. Paul's very clear about that. We, we struggle with sin. But how do we, how do we look different? What does it look like to be different, set-apart people for God? And, and we, we want to do that, not because it makes us right with Him. This comes after that's been settled. This is our response back to God. We want to live a way that glorifies Him, that looks distinct and different and points to Him as our Savior. What that also means, though, is that we have a role as priests. Now, if, if you've been in church for a while, you understand that that role as priests has a, has a very important function that, that we no longer have to go to, to priests to ask us to, to intervene for us with God. And the Old Testament people used to have to go to the priest and say, would you sacrifice this animal for me? And, and they'd get, would you pray for me? And because the, the priests were in, intermediaries between the people and God. But all of that changed at the death of Jesus. When the temple veil was torn in two, it changed everything. And, and no longer did people have to go to priests because they were a priest. They are a priest. They have direct access to God. And, and in, in Protestant Christian circles, we've known that for a long time. We rejoice with that. We can pray directly to God. And that is a very important part of the priesthood of all believers. But there's a lot more to it than that. And see, the problem is sometimes we stop there. But there's more to it. You see, the priests in the Old Testament also had other roles. They were people who taught the people. They were that, that connection to God for a lot of people. They were that, that intermediary, uh, that, that person between God and the people. And, and what happened is sometimes people get the idea that the priests like lived in Jerusalem the whole time. Nope. Most of them actually spent two weeks a year. They had a rotation. They'd go and they'd spend two weeks a year and then they'd, they'd be there for all the holidays because that's when all the people would come to sacrifice animals. But most of the time they lived in all the different towns and villages that were around Israel and Judea. 
And most of their life consisted of the teaching ministry and, and pointing people to God and setting an example. That was what they were supposed to be doing. It was meant to be doing that, to be ministering right there in their communities. It's just at, at certain times of the year, they would go and they would function in that, that priestly role at the temple. Now, here's why that's important to us. Today, we, we still have that role. We, that, that, that part of the role doesn't go away. In fact, we have a role in the midst of, of our community, in the midst of people, where we, we don't get just direct access with God. We actually have that, that role as priests today as we interact with people. I was talking with a, a group of pastors a few weeks ago, and uh, one of the things we were talking about is it's becoming more and more common for, for people to come to us and say, hey, can you help us, can you help me, that's the other person, do a funeral for a friend or a family? They don't have a connection with church and, and kind of going to church would be weird for them. And so they asked me to come and say a few words or do something kind of for this departed loved one. Can you give me some ideas on what to do? And it's actually becoming more and more common every year that we get those requests. And it makes total sense to me. Because when we were a culture, when the church was at the center, almost everybody had a connection to a church. But as the church has moved more and more to the margins, less and less people have a connection to a church. And when crisis hits, when something happens where people go, I, need, I know I need a connection with God, they look around for the person that looks the holiest, right, that we just talked about, They're the person that seems to have a life that aligns with God, that seem, they seem to have a connection to God, and they go, can you pray for me? Can you help me here? Here's why this is important for you and for me. We live in the midst of a world where that's becoming more and more common. And, and for you to simply say, well, why don't you come talk to my pastor? Not going to fly. Not going to fly. God has placed you in the midst of family, in the midst of coworkers and neighbors and those kind of things as that priest, as that person who serves as that representative of God right in their midst. And this will become more and more common if if you live as a holy person, one who's set apart. If you don't do that, if people can't tell you're a follower of Jesus, you probably won't get asked. You, they, they probably won't come to you. But if you look different, if you look like someone who has a connection with God, they will come to you. And they will say, help me. Pray for me. And that's, that's your chance to bear witness. And it's, it's, this is a huge shift in how most of us see ourselves. This is not how the people of God for 1,700 years have seen themselves. For the early church, that's exactly how they saw themselves. But for a long, long time, we haven't. And, and it's, it's becoming more and more important that we understand ourselves in that light and in that role. The final thing for us this morning is that being part of God's holy people in a royal priesthood cannot be a passive experience. God doesn't save you and just put you in a holding tank and says, wait here until I come back for you. Wait here until you die. Never was the plan. In fact, Jesus prayed exactly the opposite of that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. And Father, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And Jesus prayed that for you and for me. It's never meant to be a passive experience in our relationship with God. One of the things we notice is that God is always at work in the world around us. And if you want to figure out what your place is, what your calling is, you watch for what he is doing. Jesus did this. Jesus said, I can do nothing unless I, unless, except what I, what I hear and what I see from the Father. And that, that's such an important verse for us to understand. This this verse actually becomes kind of the, the, the key verse for, for a book called Experiencing God. And we use this for some of our leadership uh, training here. And, and I'll, I'll, I can save you the whole trouble reading the book. The main idea is watch for what God is doing and join him. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, there's the save you weeks and weeks of reading right there. And, and, but his whole idea, Blackaby's idea with this is that, that God is always at work in the world around us. He, he's doing stuff whether or not you're paying attention, whether or not you're praying, whether or not that. God's just got his own story and he's in the middle of it and, and he invites you in. And if you want to understand what he's called you to do, watch what he's put in front of you 
If you understand what he's called the church to do, watch what he's put in front of the church. See those things and then join in. That's a big part of how you understand part of who you've been made to be. Part of, part of your story within God's story is to understand that piece. Now, I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit and talk about who we are as a church for just one second, but it'll make sense. So when we look at uh, how we classify our missions as a church, we talk in terms of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Hopefully that sounds familiar because Jesus uh, talked about that in our, our, one of our readings this morning. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And w- the way we categorize that, Jerusalem for us is, is, our, is our local community. We, we just happen to categorize that as Franklin Pierce School District. Uh, that, that's, that's how we categorize that. The, the Judea is the surrounding area, which is more like Pierce County and, and where a lot of the rest of us live and, and things like that. Uh, then Samaria is, is stuff that's a little further. Like right now today, we got the, a, a team at Nia Bay, uh, at the church there helping them. That we, that's part of our, our Samaria type ministries and then ends of the earth those are things like what we're getting ready to do with Compassion International uh, are the Pattersons where they're they're missionaries and in, in Southeast Asia uh, those kind of things that's how we categorize and how we see ourselves as a church and today we're ta- we're going to talk about just one piece the Jerusalem part just just that one piece of, of what we do as a church and what God has called us into also when we do ministry we, we look, uh, we have kind of a, a metric that we measure things by, good, better, and best. We say good is if you can do something, some good in the community, that, that you can feed some people or you can fix some cars or th- those kind of things that we do all the time. But we say better is if you can do that and build a relationship. Best is if you can do the first two things and have the potential of making a disciple. And because there are so many opportunities that that are given to us as individuals and churches far more than we could ever take advantage of, we don't really have an interest in doing things that don't have the potential of going to best. For interest, for instance, we have an opportunity sometimes to fix cars from all over the place at our auto shop. And sometimes people want to come from Seattle. We go, you know, that we could do good, but the potential for relationship, which goes to better or making a disciple, is really not there. And so we go, we'd rather not do that one. We'd rather not do that. We'd rather focus on the community where we have the potential of not only doing good, but going better to best. Knowing that, I want to tell you about a gift that we have received. A very unique thing that that God has handed to us as a church. A lot of you know about the the ministries we have right now in our community, like Backpacks for Kids and Faith in Action and uh, some of the stuff we're going to do in a couple weeks, going out and redo the outside of another school. Those have been amazing things to us. But God has opened up an opportunity um, that I I haven't seen anywhere else before. And, and, And I have the privilege of working with a lot of different churches and pastors around the country. Uh, that are outreach oriented. And, and I see a lot of them that have a chance to work with schools, an individual school. But what I have not seen before is the way that God has given us favor in an entire district, the way that we have. And, and uh, we, we have favor within the Franklin Pierce School District. I mean, given opportunities that we never should really have had. Uh, that, that things have been opened up to us that nobody is smart enough to make happen. Nobody's smart enough to figure out how to make this work. And, and, it, and it's, it's grown a lot over the last few years. For instance, this is uh, last Wednesday, we're packing backpacks for kids and they're, they're getting ready to go out. And, and what, what I noticed when I stopped by is that about 75% of the people there weren't from our Savior. Uh, these are people that continue to come from the community and, and a lot of teachers and things like that uh, from the school district that, that love what's going on there. They want to be part of this. And, and we had to change how the ministry works from just finding people to pack backpacks to, to having team leaders who can organize it to now having to figure out how do we have people that build relationships with the people who can continue to come back again and again because they want to have a way to do good in the community. Now, um, that Franklin Pierce School District has got 15 schools that are part of it. Uh, I won't give you too many of the details here. That's what it looks like. And what we do right now is we do about 160 backpacks a week in nine different schools. Uh, and the feed kids over the weekend that wouldn't otherwise eat. 
A uh, growing number of projects that we do for faith in action in our auto repair ministry happen to come from connections in the school district. And when we go and we give a facelift to uh, the school, go, go and help redo the outside, we're, we're doing our, our fourth one this year. We do it every year on National Volunteer Day, or National, National Volunteer Week. And last year was at Franklin Pierce High School. We had about 300 volunteers and just kind of did some amazing work on the grounds that were there. You'll see a p couple pictures of that in our announcements later. And these have given us credibility and open doors in ways that we never would have anticipated. And what we have now is that we're, we're getting asked for more and more by the school district. They see us as, as a partner that, that, seems, that seems to care, that seems to have people who are willing to, to sacrifice their own self-interest to help other people and, and who are genuinely loving people who want to, to love uh, the people in our community. And things that we're getting asked for, in addition to what we already do, is like this, can you provide financial classes for our parents? We just happened to finish Financial Peace University. Yes, we can. What about parenting classes? Can you, can you provide parenting classes for the parents of our students? Can you help with recess activities? Can you send us watchdog dads? Can you help with math and reading during the classroom? Those are the specific requests that have come in recently. And they said, can you help us? Can you help us more and more? And, and these doors that have been opened to us are, are pretty amazing uh, that where people are asking us to do that. And so what we said is we want to put together a pilot program. We want to take what we're doing right now and bump it to the next level. And, and this is where you have to like not hold me to any of this stuff because it's all, it's a pilot, it's in flux, and so it's going to look maybe a little bit something like this, but the, in the end will probably look very different. Here's just what we're thinking right now. The gift that God has given us, that, that open door to just walk in and to have a chance to help transform our community by investing in kids uh, is, is pretty much there. It's, it, it, it's what God's done. I don't think anybody argues with that. Nobody's smart enough to figure out how to pull off the doors that have been opened to us. What remains to be seen is how we actually take advantage of that as a church. So the, the Franklin Pierce School District, um, one of the poorest, uh, poorest in Pierce County uh, and, and actually not, not too hot in the overall state ranking either. And uh, a lot of poverty, a lot of ways that, that darkness manifests itself there that, that it just looks different than in places that are a little more economically advantaged. And we've been given an open door. And so we're, 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 we're launching a pilot program where we're gonna have a, a team leader that's gonna go in and just kinda interface with the, 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 the principal, the teachers, and, and some other staff that are there, like the PTA and those, those kind of things, the leadership there. And they're gonna have a, that person's gonna have a whole team that supports them. There's a prayer team devoted just to that school. There's a financial peace facilitator that goes and teaches classes there as much as they want them. There's a, a parenting class facilitator and a team that go and they figure out what the needs are and, and we go and do it. But when we do it, uh, as much as possible, we say, you know, we do it from the perspective of a Christ follower. Uh, someone who comes and, and helps out the teachers. You know, a lot of the PTAs uh, that we've run into, they're like three people uh, are like on the PTA. It's just not a strong support, uh, parent-teacher support organization. So we're, we're, how do you support the teachers in that way? Um, even how do you bring some of the resources to the students? Um, things like the math and the reading help, those kind of things. There's going to be a team around that. And then someone else who just understands the, the community resources that can be a help for parents. Some of the stuff we offer as a church, some of the stuff that the rest of the community offers. Th those are just some of the things that we're, we're looking at as we explore partnering with one single school right now. But we're thinking that as this happens, um, there's going to be an amazing response. Just to give you an idea, the, when, when we did, when we redid the outside of the first school about four years ago, there were a whole bunch of other ones that said, can we be next? <laughs> please pick me, right? And, and so we kind of sort through that and just pick, we can really only do one a year. And, and they kind of line up to say, can, can we be next? I think that's going to happen with this, that we're going we're gonna to pilot this with one school next year. Uh, and, 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 and if we do this well as a church, there's going to be people that say, can our school be next? Can you come and, and put this kind of blessing and this kind of love 
on our school. We want to be next because we see what you're doing. It's going to transform the lives of the kids and the parents and ultimately the community by investing in them in this way. Now, we're open to partnering with other churches and things like that, but what you find is a lot of times people say we're open to that, but the reality sets in they can't figure out how to do it for whatever reason. They're not able to actually pull the trigger uh, on, on how to do this. But God has given us an opening. And I think for us as the people of God, when we look at that gift, we say, what do you do with that? Do you leave it there on the table and say, well, hopefully someone else will take it. Hopefully someone else will do something with it. Or do you say, this is our part of the story. This is our part as a church in God's story here and now. Over the next few, few weeks, we're going to unpack more and more about some of the shifts that, that, that have to happen in order to, to do this and to be that kind of a church. Uh, as we talk about the church and the family and the, and the community and the world, we'll talk about that. We'll unpack more and more, I think, where God's taken us over the next 15 years as a church. But this is just one small sliver. This is just a piece of what I think our Jerusalem looks like as we engage more and more. So here, here's the thing for you as we prepare to go. One, what does your next step as a royal priest look like? What's that look like for you? You've got more and more people in your life that don't feel like they have a direct connection with God. And you, you are that person in lives of, of some of your family members and some of your neighbors and some of your coworkers. Does it mean to, to live a life that, that looks a little more holy? A life that, that looks to be a little, little more different and, and aligned with God. Maybe that's your next step. Or maybe it's to be open when somebody comes to you with a problem. Don't just say, I'll pray about it, but can I pray with you right now? That might be your next step. Just figure out what is that next step for you as a royal priest. And then what I want to know is, is if some of what we talked about today about what God's called us to do in the Franklin Pierce School District, if, if that's touched your heart, and that's tugged at your heart, and you go, you know, I want to figure out how to be a part of that. I don't know why, you don't have to know what it is, and, and you want to be part of that, even helping us shape it and figure out what it looks like, uh, let us know on your connection card, because we, we want to figure out, put together some teams that help us figure this out, figure out what it's going to look like and what it means to invest in the community in that way, as we'd love to have you be a part of that, because we're going we're gonna to launch a pilot, but then we're hoping to do more. We're hoping to do more as we get it figured out, as, as we want to love God, love people, live like Jesus right here in this community. It just, it, this is one of the ways I think that can look like. Well, I've taken way more than my allotted sermon time for this, so we're going we're gonna, to um, close in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this opportunity that you've set before us. We thank you that you've called us to be a holy people, a people that are set apart for your purposes, and you've also called us to be royal priests. So, Father, uh, we know that that means thinking differently than we have in the past about who we are and our identity. And, Father, we just pray for the courage to face that and to really let that sink in and change who we are, that we can represent you to the world around us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're gonna